So today, as my colleague Chris Desen has said, is a joyous day, a day of great celebration, of great excitement. Uh, Leah Castaneda uh, Anastasio is uh, someone dear to the heart of many members of this institution, many members of this faculty. I remember vividly when Leah first came to Harvard Law School, she had been the star student at the top of a class uh, at uh, Ateneo in Manila. And she was interested in business law. And as her time, securities, business law, and as her time here during that first year uh, wore on, uh, she got, thanks to Henry Steiner, who is in the room, and others, more and more interest in uh, uh, legal history and human rights law and constitutional law and public law issues. And it was just a joy, even then, to see her, uh, her uh, give voice to this passion she had and blossom as a scholar. Uh, the time since then has been uh, extraordinary. I think more than any other SJD student, uh, Leah took good advantage of this institution, working with, I'm probably going to forget some people, but working with uh, Chris Desan, Chris, uh, co-supervisor of her dissertation, uh, incredibly devoted and wonderful uh, mentor, uh, Henry Steiner, uh, Jane Bestor, uh, Jerry Newman, Mort Horwitz, uh, Ken Mack is here, uh, Frank Michaelman, and uh, probably forgetting uh, others, but, the, but Leo tapped the faculty in the best sense, uh, talking to people. Um, just a wonderful exemplar of what a scholar should be in sort of developing her ideas, testing her ideas, uh, welcoming uh, uh, critique and challenge. Uh, the product of that was a superb doctoral dissertation that won the uh, Young Kim Prize here at the law school. And then uh, the book you have in front of you, uh, if you're going to buy it, which you should, uh, The Foundations of the Modern Philippine State. Uh, Leah's uh, dissertation that became the book uh, without profound, modi some modification, uh, uh, also won the William Nelson Cromwell Prize, the American Society of Legal History, and so it's just, it's really a joy, as Chris said, to uh, uh, be able to celebrate. Uh, I so much enjoyed working with her. Let me quickly introduce our other two uh, speakers, and then uh, we will start with Leah uh, 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 giving us a short presentation. Um, Jerry Newman is a longtime friend and colleague who is the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law. Uh, Jerry is also the co-director of the Human Rights Program here at Harvard Law School. He was a member of the Human Rights Committee uh, and it, it, the overall worldwide Human Rights Committee, the treaty body that monitors compliance with the uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And he's just been uh, an amazing scholar of of uh, immigration law, of legal history, of human rights, uh, long before Guantanamo became the uh, aberration and uh, horror that it is. Jerry, presciently, a decade or more in advance, uh, wrote about just what might happen. Uh, um, strangers to the Constitution, uh, immigration, Immigrants, Borders, and Fundamental Law is a book he wrote 20 years ago that uh, stood the test of time extremely well, and he's very active in working with Leah. And Chris uh, Capasola was kind enough to come over from his perch at MIT, where he is a distinguished historian. He's a graduate of Harvard with his PhD from Columbia. Uh, his first book, Uncle Sam Wants You, World War I and the Making of the Modern American Citizen from Oxford Press, uh, uh, won the Lois P. Rudnick Book Prize. Uh, He's also won history prizes, such as uh, history teaching prizes, the Leviton Teaching Award. Um, his Letter work on Brothers of the Pacific about uh, U.S. soldiers going to the Philippines, Philippine soldiers coming working in the West. Uh, uh, sounds fascinating. We'll have him back next fall to talk about that. Uh, part of that project won the 2014 Cold War Essay Prize by the University of Virginia. And it's just uh, a, a pleasure as well to have him. So we our format is we'll turn to Leah, and then our two commentators will speak after her, and then uh, uh, opportunity for questions. Thank you, Professor Alfred. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. I am really thrilled and honored to be back at Harvard Law School to talk about this project, especially since it was conceived right here during my LLM year. <laughs> I mean, the beginnings of it. 
I feel I've gone full circle returning to where this journey began. And I'm so grateful to my supervisor, Professor Alred in East Asian Legal Studies, and to June Casey and the Harvard Law Library for hosting this book talk, as well as to Alonzo Emery for organizing it. Very special thanks to Professors Newman and Capazola um, for taking part in today's event. Um, as the title suggests, my book traces the design and dynamic of the modern Philippine state to the introduction to the Philippine islands of American liberal constitutionalism as both the ideology and technology for Republican empire. While focused primarily on the Philippines, the study also offers insights to jurisdictions where essential elements of the Philippine model for establishing American style democratic and market institutions have resurfaced. My book engages several fields. Um, it in intervenes in the comparative law literature on legal transplants, law and development, and comparative constitutional law by modeling an approach to doing a deeply contextualized and fine-grained country study of constitutional transplantation. It also intervenes in four historiographies, two American and two Philippine. On the US side, I, I study, well, the use of American law as a colonial tool, and so I emphasize more the legal dimension of this um, recently, uh, well, not, not too recent, but the US empire scholarship, which began in the early 2000s to um, break the insularity of a more national exceptionalist historiography. And it also contributes an imperial dimension to American legal history, trying to extend critical legal historical approaches to the colonial operation of American law. Specifically, I tried to spell out the concrete implications of the insular cases for colonial governance. What did it mean for America's commitment to the rule of law, for its government to enjoy unbridled power and possessions outside its borders? And how did this work, like on the ground? What did it look like? Within Philippine historiography of the American colonial period, my work dovetailed with simultaneous projects undertaken by a group of scholars that gathered at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006, when Professor Campasola was there. Um, and, we, the, and the goal was primarily to synthesize the field's two dominant methodological approaches, one that was more empirical but criticized as deterministic, and one that is more textual and interpretive but kind of weak with the empirical side. I tried to achieve this inf um, synthesis by demonstrating law's constitutive relationship with the Philippine colonial context, tried to, to take the ideas seriously, and then connecting them to their expressions in institutional practice. I've also tried to move away from the literature's preoccupation with individual actors to examine the ideological and institutional architecture that defined the range of their possible actions. But perhaps I think my biggest contribution has been towards transforming, trying to transform a predominantly internalist Philippine legal historiography, where the few contextual studies tend to be very functionalist and instrumental. The aspiration was to try to create a new discourse, so this was my attempt to lay the foundations for that effort. But even as I situate my project within larger debates, its origins are quite personal. It is inextricable from my experience as a martial law baby who came of age during the political upheaval following Ninoy Aquino's assassination. I was 15 when he was shot upon arriving home after years in exile, part of which he spent right here as a visiting scholar with East Asian Legal Studies. Um, when the legality of Marcus's martial law declaration was questioned before the Philippine Supreme Court in the 1970s, I was surprised to read Justice Cecilia Munoz Palmas acknowledge that her dissenting opinion was based more on conscience rather than on law. And it made me wonder how could the constitutional system that was modeled after, indeed spawned by an, its American prototype, enable the very tyranny that it was designed to prevent? Conventional wisdom concluded that Marcus's evil genius had thwarted a system that was otherwise sound, but was it sound? For 30 years since his overthrow, Philippine politics seems no different whether good or bad people have been in charge. This made me turn to the playing field for answers. And the more I learned about the Philippine constitutional order, the more I realized that the tyrannical potential unleashed by Marcos was built into the system's very beginnings during American colonial rule. One can more readily grasp the irony of a constitutional dictator in a liberal democratic republic when one sees that the Philippine constitutional order was conceived in another irony, that of a liberal constitutional and democratic republican empire. The debate surrounding the decision to acquire the Philippine Islands and Puerto Rico from Spain after the Spanish-American War show how the colonial project for the islands was shaped by the need to reconcile the coercive nature of colonialism with the volition and restraint of an American constitutional democracy 
that was considered exceptional or different from or superior to the monarchical and despotic traditions of European imperialism. To harmonize American imperialism with the rule of law essential to American identity, Senator Henry Teller proposed that the U.S. administer its new acquisitions precisely in accordance with democratic and constitutional values. So the government had to derive its powers from the consent of the government and that political rights and privileges of the people were to be observed, but as qualified by their condition. These prescriptions, which he uttered in the Senate deliberations over the Treaty of Paris, were not merely rhetorical, but prefigured the government of the Philippine Islands, or the insular government. Um, so the insular government had consent in having native representation and constitutional protections through separation of powers in the Bill of Rights. So while monarchical imperialists designed plural legal systems to govern citizens and subjects in their colonies, Americans undertook to use their own law and believe this to be benevolent. Yet full participation in this legal regime was premised on fully developed capacities honed by education and upbringing within a civilized, that is, a Western cultural context. So since Filipinos were uncivilized, their condition altered the nature of consent and constitutionalism in the insular government. My book explores precisely the consequences of rendering, implementing, and legitimating these colonial civilizing goals in the language, processes, and doctrines of its constitutional tradition. The program for realizing this balancing act was put in place during the so-called Taft era or first 13 years of American rule. Insular Supreme Court Justice George Malcolm described this balancing exercise as an anomaly that produced a nearly impossible government which was not foreign to the U.S., yet foreign in some respects, not sovereign, yet having the attributes of sovereignty, not a state, yet patterned after a state, not under the Constitution, but influenced by the Constitution, with the Filipinos not being aliens, yet not citizens of the U.S. And the government and, laws of, uh, and the laws of Congress, presidential orders, did not operate in the country directly, yet the representatives of the Filipinos could not make their own laws without... Um, without any restriction from outside power. The essentials of this nearly impossible government is what Filipino framers preserved in the 1935 Constitution, and that facilitated Marcos's constitutional dictatorship. So how did civilization qualify consent and constitution and create the American Empire's version of the despotic? Since Filipinos lacked sovereign capacity, their consent was irrelevant to the legality of American rule. But Americans still paid heed to consent by trying to create consensual capacity, by civilizing Filipinos and their milieu to support a democracy and training them in self-government in appointed and elective offices through a graduated program that progressively increased their presence and control over the government as they acquired capacity. They portrayed this program as what Filipinos truly wanted. But privileging capacity drew Americans to collaborate with a faction of the Ilustrados, or the local directing class composed of the wealthiest, most educated Filipinos whose values overlap with theirs, but who supported the American program. This so-called policy of attraction, which was um, initiated by uh, William Howard Taft as the first American governor general, wed Americans to Ilustrado interests and gave an elitist cast to Philippine politics that endures to this day. But this Filipino cooperation proxied for consent, even if it wasn't sovereignty, it was approval of the program, and gave legitimacy to the colonial government within America's democratic tradition. But at the same time, it also gave Filipino leaders tremendous leverage, even though they were not sovereign, as we shall later see. As for the Constitution, civilization tweaked constitutional limits, both structural and substantive, by structural limits, I mean federalism and separation of powers. Federalism did not act as a check on American colonialism because the island stood outside this relationship. To accommodate possessions that would never be states, the insular cases created unincorporated territories and paved the way for the forging of a more potent variant of American constitutionalism in these areas, one that unleashed power rather than restrained it, because this new territorial category made Congress virtually a constitutional emperor by vesting in it sovereignty over distant and foreign lands. Combined in Congress, federal, state, and inherent sovereign powers subject to no constitutional limits except basic natural law rights because it gave the Constitution only moral but not legal force in these places. So separation of powers also did not effectively check American sovereign power in the islands because it merely upheld an unbalanced configuration dominated by an American-held executive 
over three organic acts, namely McKinley's Instructions, the 1902 Organic Act, and the 1916 Jones Law, the War Department and the U.S. Congress put the insular government on a path of progressive evolution from a territorial government structure to a state government structure. So in the central government, they started with a mixed American-Filipino body called the Philippine Commission, in which were fused executive and legislative powers and which had an American majority, and then moved towards separating and assigning executive and legislative functions into distinct branches and concentrated executive power in Americans and legislative power in Filipinos, giving the latter full control first over a lower house called the Philippine Assembly in 1907, and then both houses of the legislature by 1916. In this way, constitutional law was enlisted to neutralize colonial identities, channel colonial conflict into constitutional categories, and settle conflict through the mechanical application of law. But there was no balance between the departments because Americans infused their governing principles into the remnants of a Spanish colonial structure that they had taken over. And this structure had pretty recently, I mean, dr late part of Spanish um, a rule, centralized in the governor general top-down control over insular administration from Manila to the barrios, and consolidated in the governor general compete the competing and overlapping jurisdictions that had previously been farmed out to different heads under Spain as a way to check him. Taking over this structure constituted the insular government with a single, as a single administrative unit with the American governor general as its unrivaled head. So there's never any question that the administration was part of the executive branch in the islands. Moreover, as Filipinos captured the legislature, the organic acts compensated for the loss of American legislative control by strengthening and accumulating executive power in the governor general. It, for, they, for instance, they gave him the power to initiate the budget, and he benefited from a feature called automatic appropriations in case the legislature could not or did not want to pass a budget. Um, so when we extol separation of powers as a safeguard against tyranny, it bears asking tyranny by whom and from whom. Operating against a background of legislative supremacy in the U.S. mainland, the American constitutional system was designed to curb majoritarian tyranny, or legislative despotism. But these traditional devices didn't address the real source of tyranny in the islands, which was the executive. Using the prevailing separate spheres approach, the Philippine Supreme Court only ratified this lopsided design by shielding from judicial scrutiny the political branches' exercises of their constitutional discretion and insulated the governor general by declaring off-limits all of his official acts, whether assigned by statute or inherent in the nature of his office. Substantive limits in the Bill of Rights, likewise, did not effectively check the insular government's use of vast powers as it pacified and civilized the islands. In the context of suppressing rebellion and epidemic disease, the court built jurisprudential support for the government's invasive and transformative work. Thanks again to the separate spheres approach, the court accorded deferential scrutiny to legislation, presuming it constitutional in most cases, and deferred to administrative expertise. The court also construed authority broadly, whether congressional or inherent in sovereignty. It enlisted the pre-liberal public rights tradition to deploy police power vigorously, even though these were rooted in a context of popular sovereignty and local self-governance that didn't exist in the islands. So not only were private rights subject to the greater public good, but private activities of uns Filipinos who were considered uncivilized were precisely of preeminent public concern in the government's civilizing agenda, and this easily met due process as public purpose requirement. The only area of activity that the Taft-era officials did not direct the government's capacity towards was creating prosperity because they believed that government's role was not meant to compete with private investment but to support and attract it. But the whole idea of attracting American capital was anathema to Filipinos who were wary of increasing foreign presence in an economy that was already controlled by the Spanish, British, and Chinese interests. So um, they preferred public development, which they expected to inherit upon independence, but they feared the Taft-era economic policy, which risked entrenching the new American interests in an already foreign-dominated economy. So by the design, it looks like the deck is really stacked against Filipinos. So whoever inherits the executive branch in the future would have all the cards in his favor. But the Filipinos were not without recourse, and the linchpin for them was the people and the privileged role displayed in the American tradition. 
Elected Filipino representatives invoked the theory of direct representation to define who did and did not constitute the Filipino people and to defi define the Filipino people's best interests. This warranted discriminating against undesirable foreigners in the economy, mainly the British and the Chinese, as well as the uncivilized among them, like the native tribes, thus reproducing colonialism internally. Philippine Equal Protection Doctrine operated to validate an elite-led majoritarian despotism. Representation also allowed them to supplant American policies and programs whose legitimacy was grounded in an indirect concept of representation and that justified the people's best interests according to progressive criteria. As Filipinos gained greater control of the legislature, the Filipino leaders, notably Speaker Sergio Asmeño, constantly tried to alter the presidential design using a quasi-parliamentary strategy, deploying tools available to legislative bodies to expand their prerogatives. So when they controlled the lower house, they tried to mimic the example of the lower houses of the British North American colonies by monopolizing appointment authority over the resident commissioners to Congress, and also the right to initiate budget and appropriations bills. But they were not able to replicate their predecessor's success because there were fail-safe mechanisms in the organic acts, such as automatic appropriations, which just passed the budget when they didn't want to pass one. When they gained full control of the insular legislature, the Filipinos used this as a way to capture the administration, first by cutting the governor general off from the administration because they channeled administ the, the power to set policy and to hire personnel to Filipino department secretaries and held them accountable to the legislature. And they also created hybrid administrative bodies, hybrid executive legislative bodies, ran by the governor general, but with the speaker and the Senate president in the same board. So there was a super cabinet called the Council of State that ran the government's day-to-day -day business, and a super board of director called the Board of Control that managed government properties. Now the government properties, the most prominent one would be the government corporations, because once Osmeña captured the the government, he redirected the economic policy by Filipinizing or nationalizing the economy. And the strategy he used for doing this is still familiar to today's, which was to invest public revenue in government companies to compete with foreigners controlling major industries like sugar. So the investment of public revenue was equated with Filipino investment and government in business meant a Filipino economy. When the Republicans took over the White House in 1921 and Governor General Wood became the new executive. He tried to reinstate the old program by enforcing strict separation of powers and getting government out of business. This led to constitutional warfare between the executive and the legislature, which was now led by Senate President Manuel Quezon and Speaker Manuel Ross, who incidentally is the grandfather of one of the presidential candidates in the last Philippine elections. This warfare triggered the cabinet crisis or the en masse resignation of the Council of State and also the Board of Control cases when he abolished this body by executive order. Both the Philippine and U.S. Supreme Courts upheld Governor General Wood's um, position and this vindicated the original design. It's, it got rid of the Filipino alterations to the government and reinstated the original program but it left unaltered the government and business strategy and with it the government's developmental capacity. So th the Board of con Cor Control Cases Settlement was what essentially was reconstituted as the Philippine government in the, in the 1935 Constitution. And in doing so, they, uh, they also modeled the Philippine president after the American Governor General, but even gave him more powers. And in doing that, they reproduced and perpetuated this colonial dynamic and provided the apparatus and justification for constitutional authoritarianism. So I think in light of that, we can better understand Justice Palmas lament that she could only dissent on moral rather than legal grounds in the martial law cases for nothing in the system truly foreclosed what Marcus did. Indeed, it enabled him just as it enabled the governor's general after whom the Philippine president was modeled, just as it will enable leaders with totalitarian proclivities both now and in the future. So I look forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for being here uh, to listen to this discussion of this truly marvelous book. Yes, my microphone is not on. Truly marvelous book.
Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, Spanish-American War of 1898 uh, sparked a big debate in the United States between imperialists and anti-imperialists, uh, those who wanted to extend U.S. power beyond the continent by emulating European colonial systems, and those who argued that acquiring an overseas empire would imperil the Republican tradition here. Uh, one anti-imperialist, the sociologist uh, William Graham Sumner, uh, gave a lecture uh, and published it uh, called The Conquest of the United States by Spain, uh, arguing that the United States had won the physical war uh, but was surrendering to Spain's ideology. In 1901, the Supreme Court accommodated the imperialists by a five to four vote uh, in the case that spawned Mr. Dooley's famous observation that regardless of whether the Constitution follows the flag, the Supreme Court follows the election returns. Uh, so that set up this tremendous problem of to what extent does the Constitution go across the earlier borders of the United States uh, into newly acquired territory uh, or into territory that is in some sense uh, considered foreign. Uh, a problem uh, that we still struggle with today uh, in famous examples uh, like Guantanamo uh, and uh, more recently uh, issues regarding Puerto Rico. Uh, these issues are still with us in the United States today uh, but in those discussions, there has been much less focus on the experience in the Philippines, uh, precisely because the Philippines became an independent country uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and so this book uh, fills a tremendous gap in our understanding, our deeper understanding of the historical development of things that may be more shallowly known as cases and doctrines uh, by those who try to understand U.S. constitutional development. Uh, and as Leah Castaneda's book makes clear, these issues have also continued to trouble the Philippines after independence when the United States is no longer in the picture in quite the same way. Even those who know a lot about uh, the subject of U.S. territorial constitutionalism uh, can learn a great deal from this book. Uh, there's also a lot of interest in reading the book in meeting old friends. Uh, it's no surprise to meet President Taft. It's well known that he was the governor general uh, in the Philippines. Uh, but the list of governors general also includes Supreme Court Justice Frank Murphy, Henry Stimson, who was Hoover's Secretary of State and Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of War, uh, and others uh, showing how the colonies were proving grounds for rising leaders uh, in the metropolis. And then we also meet General Leonard Wood, who was absolutely ubiquitous uh, in these U.S. colonial ventures. U.S. governance of overseas territories is often discussed from the perspective of individual rights. How much does the Constitution follow the flag in terms of extending the Bill of Rights of its own force to people in new territories, uh, including not only the original inhabitants, uh, but mainland citizens who travel there? Uh, but this book concentrates more on structural issues, uh, as you've heard. Uh, especially the issues of concentrated executive power. Uh, in fact, it's not clear how much protection constitutional rights afforded, even back in the states at that period, before the development of modern doctrines on free speech, equality, uh, and criminal procedure. As Philippine institutions were remodeled to resemble U.S. institutions, at least in part, uh, the governor general remained a powerful executive, the representative of the mainland authority 
and will. This conflict of interest between colonizer and colonized distorts the structure of government. Uh, and as the book explains, uh, the tradition of executive powers was then passed on to the Philippines Constitution as it prepared for independence. Once all branches of government were in Philippine hands, uh, the document established an imperial local president with the power to suspend habeas corpus uh, and declare martial law, including other things uh, that the US president cannot do at home. It seems to me that this book prompts a question for research about our own domestic constitutional history. Uh, the unitary executive theory that comes and goes in modern constitutional law traces its origin back to Chief Justice Taft's majority opinion in Myers versus United States. Uh, and it's often remarked in that connection that Taft was speaking as a former president, but I think rarely noticed that he was also a former governor general of the Philippines. How much was Taft's thinking about executive power influenced by his experience as a colonial governor uh, and his observation of the disputes that his successors uh, had gotten involved in? Uh, I also want to observe what may be a certain irony in the way these events played out uh, during US management of the Philippines. Uh, the struggles that the book documents varied from governor general to governor general, partly in alignment with Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, some governors general were more respectful of Philippine political parties and politicians uh, and more favorable to relatively rapid movement toward independence. Uh, others were more distrustful uh, of local parties and politicians. Uh, and more interested in maintaining US control uh, for a much longer period. Uh, Leonard Wood was one of the most confrontational, uh, as we've heard, and he tried to break up the structures of patronage that the local politicians were forming, which later became some of the important tools uh, of the subordination of the legislature to the Philippine president. Uh, the more trustful attitudes of subsequent administrations allowed the Philippines to transition toward independence uh, with this constitution that vested too much power in the Philippine president. Uh, if that is a paradox, uh, then maybe the lesson is that it is hard for any good to come out of colonialism, uh, including from the conquest of the United States by Spain. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for, for coming, um, uh, and thank you, Leah, for allowing me to be part of the, uh, uh, this Valentine's Day gift of, of sort of uh, that we are sending you today uh, to, to thank you for, for writing this book and giving us a chance to, to talk about it. Um, I'm going to just say um, two, uh, two great things about it, um, raise um, sort of one quibble, um, and then ask you two questions. Um, so we'll go, go from there. Um, so the, the boldest praise, uh, I think that we can all, uh, every scholar will agree, this is the best book ever written about Philippine legal history. Um, now if you've looked at that shelf uh, of books, you might ask, is that a backhanded compliment? <laughs> um, because in fact, as you point out, uh, there, the, the literature is not as um, sort of in many ways uh, trapped in sort of doctrinal and even sort of almost hornbook style uh, kind of books on, on, on the field. Um, but uh, I mean it as a real compliment, not a backhand. Right. Uh, and uh, let me give you some reasons, and, or the audience, I guess, who hasn't read all these books, uh, the reasons why. First of all, this is the deepest and most fully researched book ever written on uh, Philippine legal history in terms of archival materials, published records, treatises, um, and the records of both the Philippine Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court. It's astonishing how little of the published opinions of the Philippine Supreme Court have been used by scholars, uh, both in US and Philippine history. Uh, second, it's, uh, it's, it stands out for spanning the entire colonial period from 1898 to uh, 1935 and even a bit beyond, um, rather than focusing simply on the, the Spanish-American and Philippine-American War, 
uh, which has drawn a great deal of attention from, for example, John Fabian Witt and Clara Altman in her recent dissertation, um, or uh, by examining just the insular cases alone, looking at the Philippines from the seat of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, by, uh, that has been done by so many people in the last few years. Really, instead, looking at the day-to-day -day administration, showing ongoing contests and remakings of the constitutional order. Um, third, it is incredibly uh, successful in turning our attention away from individuals and towards institutions. Um, that uh, this is the, the, the habit in Philippine uh, sort of colonial history toward uh, prosopography, right, or collective biography, uh, is a result in part of archival practices um, that have preserved the papers of leading figures rather than the Bureau of Insular Affairs, whose records are in disarray. Uh, or the records of the colonial legal system, which exist uh, almost not at, at all. Uh, um, but it is also a, a historiographic problem um, that these, uh, th these individuals are larger than life characters. Um, uh, William Howard Taft and Leonard Wood uh, on the US side, uh, Sergio Osmeña and Manuel Quezon on the Philippine side. Um, th and uh, so that sort of tends to focus on individuals and leaders, giving us an overly biographical approach uh, to this history. Uh, and it is not fully redressed by the efforts in Philippine historiography of the last, uh, say, 30 or 40 years to develop a history, uh, a sort of popular history, or a sort of bottom-up history in which the people and the crowd uh, sort of function in an almost sort of undifferentiated mass, uh, whether in sort of Marxist historiography or in more sort of social historical approaches of, of scholars like Reynaldo and Leto and others. So uh, instead, we need to look not at, at individuals, but at institutions, um, which brings me to, to the fourth way in which I think this book is really uh, fantastic, is that it is uh, sort of institutional legal history at its very best. Um, really, sort of, as you point out in the introduction, making a case for law in Philippine history and for history in Philippine legal studies, um, and by taking law seriously uh, as an institution. Um, and not merely as a set of sort of structures, uh, but also as a tradition, or as you say elsewhere, a set of constitutional rules, an order, um, or as you said today, a playing field, uh, or a technology, all terms that we could maybe talk about a little more in the discussion. Um, and then second, the reason that this is a really, or you know, second big way, uh, biggest contribution that this book makes is to really answer the how question. Um, of uh, U.S. imperialism in the Philippines. And this is a, a quote from, from Leah herself on page 11. She says, historians, quote, have still to specify the ways in which liberal modes and goals were at cross purposes with colonial imperatives and evaluate doctrinal and institutional consequences. Right, so we sort of always know uh, that the U.S. is an empire. Um, uh, we've known that since, um, you know, since, since William Graham Sumner was talking about it. Um, and we've always known that that was somehow at odds with American sort of modes and, and, and rhetorics, and to some extent to some of its institutions. Um, but uh, but uh, it has remained to be done to answer the how question of how it is actually that uh, those liberal modes and goals existed at cross purposes with, col with colonial imperatives. And I think that the book is really successful in doing that, starting not only with military governance, but then also moving to almost every other field of legal regulation, um, including property, political economy, uh, somewhat, some on, on religious liberty, due process, um, so much more. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, so there's you know, a, a, my Valentine's Day card uh, to, to Leah, and the reason why you should all buy the book in the back. Um, so one, one quibble and two questions. Right? So the quibble is about um, exceptionalism. Right, and so you know, when American historians hear the word exceptionalism, we reach for our revolvers, <laughs> right? Um, not least uh, of all, because uh, you know, all the more so now, when the, the 2016 GOP uh, political platform first sentence says, "We believe in American exceptionalism," um, and if any, if there's one thing that um, that um, sort of American uh, historians don't believe in, um, it's American exceptionalism. Uh, and here, I think. Um, the project is um, sort of uh, is very successful at sort of analyzing how it is that Americans and Filipinos imagined themselves in the language of exceptionalism and the institutions of exceptionalism. Um, I think the next sort of work to be done, either by you or someone who wants to do an SJG project, 
um, right. is to put that in a firmly comparative uh, uh, sort of methodological case approach, right? Where, and particularly in dialogue with the French uh, and Dutch empires, which also blended republican metropoles and imperial practices, right? And also both imagined that they were doing something um, fundamentally exceptional and different from the imperial order, broadly speaking. Uh, and similarly, it uh, requires attention to, uh, to places where the US in influenced constitutional development without formal colonial control. Right? So of course, Cuba and the Dominican Republic also become uh, sort of uh, dictatorships in the 20th century, um, but without, without the sort of day-to-day -day sort of institutional management um, that, that you trace here in, in this book. All right, so then two th big thought questions. Right? Uh, so if you, uh, if you notice, um, uh, this book is published in the Cambridge University Press series on American law and society, which is where I think it belongs. Um, uh, and, and I hope that American legal historians will all read it. Um, but what would it look like if, this, if we really thought about this as a book about US legal history? Right? And you write a lot about this, and I want you to kind of uh, sort of imagine, what if the title of the book was flipped? to the foundations of the modern American state, imperial rule and the Philippine constitutional tradition. Right? Uh, and uh, you, uh, you know, what in your view might, might that look like? Um, I think it might uh, bring us to uh, US legal institutions, to US partisan politics, to changes in political thought about the state, um, and to sort of, uh, and the issues of federalism that are different in the US than in the Philippines, as you mentioned. Um, and to changing thought about the U.S. state in the period from the Gilded Age to the New Deal. Uh, and then second, and, and finally, uh, I think it is, uh, you know, it bears, goes with, or perhaps without saying, that uh, I at least found it impossible to read this book uh, this month without thinking about the relationship between history and the contemporary moment. Um, and so putting you on the spot a little bit uh, for the book you didn't write. Um, but when uh, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has authorized uh, the reburial of a former authoritarian ruler with, uh, with the honors befitting the hero of a nation, who speaks openly of his extra-legal actions, who taps popular sentiments for law and order and a vague current of martial law nostalgia. And as he announced in January, just a few weeks ago, he announces that if conditions require it, quote, I will declare martial law. No one can stop me. My country transcends everything else, even the limitations. Right. So uh, one way in, in which the Philippine constitutional tradition uh, does vary from uh, its US uh, tradition is Philippine openness to wholesale constitutional revision, either through the formal mechanism of a convention um, in 1935, in 1943, uh, the reinstallation of the 1935 convention in, 70, in 73 and 87, um, so things that Americans are, are you know, uh, would be hard to imagine Americans convening another co constitutional convention. Um, they also have the, uh, the, the mechanism of civil society action, whether on the EDSA Highway um, or, uh, or elsewhere. Um, although, notably, since 1987, formal constitutional uh, revision in the Philippines has been largely stalled, um, in part because uh, constitutional revision um, or so-called charter change or cha-cha has been seen as so openly political um, rather than sort of deeply structural and constitutional, right? So what do those uh, long traditions and, uh, and their similarities and differences um, and their current sort of uh, set, set up tell us about the strengths and the weaknesses of the Philippine constitutional tradition in its current moment, right? So to go back to Duterte's assertion, no one can stop me, uh, is, is he correct? Thank you. I think we give Leah a chance to uh, respond or comment and then open the floor. Well, thank you so much for your comments. And um, yeah, I, I'm kind of speechless. And yeah, yes, it is a wonderful Valentine's Day gift. But um, I was thinking about what it would look like if you flipped the title. Um, I guess there was a lot of work done in the early 2000s about the influence of um, the imperial experience in. I guess in policing, um, urban development, and there were, um, I guess a lot of these works tried to filter, try to look at the policies that were experimented with in the in the insular setting, and then looking at how it reshaped um, 
state, both state and I guess federal departments for, like for forestry. Um, I'm not sure though about the, I, I guess I, I haven't really looked at that side. It would be really fascinating because for me, the one, the more, maybe the issues that resonate more for me in the US setting would be, well, with the rec recent executive order for immigration. And I guess there's a lot of confusion about whether, how much can you really, can the president really do, right, in policing the borders? And I couldn't help but think about the Chinese exclusions cases, which were the set of cases that were used to justify the government, governor general's powers in the Philippine setting. Deportation were the, um, were the acts that were being challenged as well. And it was really hard to, to grasp the idea that, wow, so there's certain parts where there are different kinds of power that exist, and in this area, it's inherent, it's plenary, it's sovereign. So I guess the answer to that would have been, wow, yes, he, he really does have that kind of power. But so, whether, so the impact of the, for me, it, that was clear to me because I saw that tradition. So maybe if people were more conscious about what was happening on the outside, then the, what's happening today wouldn't be so confusing. And maybe the corrective, the, I don't know what kind of corrective action can be taken, but um, at, at least to clarify the premises of the discussion, it would be helpful to see what the experience was previously. So that's what I'm seeing the impact is. It's, it was happening there in the 1914s. And then I'm seeing the same kind of, um, it's not even a power grab, it's just an assertion of a power that's already been there. Like the loaded gun is being fired, I guess is the, so I guess that would be, that was the, I guess the main thing that um, struck me about what would happen if you flipped t um, the title and looked at the impact of the Philippine experience or the colonial experience back in the US mainland. As for the territory, can he do it? <laughs> um, the one difference between, I guess, the Philippine Supreme Court of the 19, of the American period and today is that there's a provision that's added to review grave abuse of discretion. So in the past, under the American system, there would be no way to question even that order. Like, oh, it's an official act, it's off limits, political question. Now there's a way to review it, but it doesn't mean you're gonna get an answer that's going to um, stop him. And I'm not sure whether the answer for that would be legal or there's a lot of talk about corruption. So they're, they're already talking about which justices would be more inclined to go this way and that way. So I don't know if the answer there to that would be legal. The, the, the means for stopping him would be there and the question is whether there would be the will for it. Mm -hmm. um, but as for the charter changes, my sense is that if I, when I look compare the documents from 1935 all the way up to 87, which is what we studied when I was in law school, I don't, I mean there's a, the changes I find are very superficial there's no real fundamental redistributing of authority, which I think might be a good place to start. It's just a little bit of tweaking here and there, and then there's a lot of reactionary responses to glaring abuses by an individual. Like in Marcus's case, for instance, he kept his illness hidden, so there's this whole extended section about if the president's lying about his health, what can Congress do? So it's not very far-sighted in that sense. Not very, it's more addressed to what individuals have done in the past as opposed to um, how, it, and it's, the question is always like, how do we stop him from having this, exercising this power? But I think maybe the bigger question should be how do we even distribute this power? Mm. Um, not just centrally within the, the government in Manila, but actually um, federalism is a big, is something that we're reconsidering now. I'm not really sure, but I, for me, it hasn't worked so well. I wouldn't be so um, averse to going in that direction, just seeing how it plays out. And the other thing um, that I, I think might have um, support historically, or at least the, pro the tendency to do that has always been there is more of a parliamentary setup. Because I've seen it um, in the Malolos Constitution, which was the revolutionary constitution, there was already that tendency to want to check an individual with this, you kind of disperse power more by, um, collaboration rather than having this one guy and then um, have all that control. And then even during the American period, they were using a lot of the strategies that were, that were in their revolutionary constitution, but they were justifying it under American 
um, principles, but it was actually something that they had always been doing, um, that they wanted to do, even for their own government, had their own government survived. So maybe that would be uh, something to, to consider, I think, mm -hmm. that kind of structure. Open up for our questions, please. Yes. Hi. So um, I'm taking. Oh, thanks. So I'm currently taking um, constitutional law, and what really strikes me is I grew up in the Philippines, and the, my question is, what is the value of the Philippine Constitution to the people, in your opinion? Because I don't remember even reading any of the Philippine constitutions, uh, whereas all my classmates are very in tune with what the U.S. Constitution says. Um, and apparently um, they were taught about it from a very young age, and they have an utmost respect for it. Whereas me, coming from a family with two lawyers as my parents, I don't even regard the Philippine Constitution with any kind of deference. So I'm just wondering what you think the value of the, Constitution, the Philippine Constitution is in terms of the Philippine legal landscape as a whole. You didn't take it up in class, or? <laughs> well, I don't remember it, so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I did in political science. Oh. Then, uh, yeah. In grade school, high school? No. Yeah. no. I see. Yeah. That's interesting. I wasn't the. I don't well. Value. I think it might be um, because there's such a separation between legal and political and um, in the Philippines, meaning it, what I've noticed when I first came to the U.S. was how the law was such an actor in, 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 in U.S. history, Brown v. Board of Education. Like you can mark certain important events in the U.S. with these major cases. And I don't think that, I don't recall studying Philippine history in that way, like we even note the cases. And I think maybe the problem, it's not so much that it's not valued, but it's so internal to the profession that there's no attempt to sort of try to make sense of what's going on politically by looking at the, the rules of it. So that, I guess that's how I'd answer that. It's not that it's not valued, but it's just a way of looking at the disciplines um, as being very separate and having their own internal world, I guess, yeah. Professor Desan? So, um, I'd ask you about uh, federalism, because I, for years, have thought of federalism in the United States as um, something that strikes a balance between federal and state power. But recently, given the circumstances, I've begun to think of federalism as something that actually might strike a balance between state and executive and federal executive power. So in particular, what I'm thinking about is the fact that the much maligned police forces of 50 states are separated from the national, national um, police or law enforcement, whether it's ICE or mm -hmm. whatever FBI has or national security. So immigration, for example. Um, that is to say, it suddenly becomes a check on executive power not to have military direct line and sort of military police control in 50 states. For you know whatever the vices of those police and abuses of those police, they're separately controlled. So I wonder if you could reflect on the you know the analog or sort of how this applies in the Philippines, given the I assume lack of separate police units in sort of something analogous to our state structure? So the, the sorry, the reflect on the, the so, consequences for? So, you know, so in the United States case, it's a comfort, right? It looks like okay. a check against fascism right. to have fractured police control. And I'm wondering, and I had never thought of it that way until being confronted with potentially powerful executive or ambitious <laughs> executive. So I'm wondering if you can tell a story. I mean, in terms of your book, I read it as more, including when you were writing it, as more a separation of power story, although I know it has a federalism element. And so I'm just wondering if you can amplify your thinking and sort of 
explore for us the constitutionalism of federalism as an as a check within on the, the US. executive in, uh, within in the, the Philippines, Philippines either right. then or today mm -hmm. well i think the main problem was that um, we didn't really have strong local government um, units whether from spain up to today and they tried to um, they passed a local government code because even for tax collection even local taxes went centrally to the to the, to the manila government so, and I think Chris would be able to address this more about the policing. And I think Professor McCoy had a book about the, po the Philippine police was nationalized. So maybe even just the municipal police were under the local government um, units, but that's never going to be strong enough to, to offset the control of on the legal use of force from the center. And I think that might have been, I think I understand that during the American period that was the, the design to centralize the use of force and where you could control it. But, um, and even today I think they militarize police to attack. It, it, there's sort of not that much separation between police and military, but I'm not too sure about that, but that's just the impression I get when they send off um, units to, to, to go to the, places where they're uh, not insurgents, but um, terrorist organizations operating. And um, so it ca right now, the way it's designed, it probably won't be such a, a rival center of power just because everything is still um, pretty much controlled from the center. Uh, Tina Alvear. Thank, Thank you very much. This is very interesting. When I heard you speaking, I couldn't stop thinking of Puerto Rico, where I have spent, I've been a visiting professor there a couple of times, and you know, fearing that I may ask you about a book that you haven't written, of course. I was wondering if you could say something about both methodological insights that one could apply from your um, work to what happens in you know very clear link as Professor Newman uh, stated with uh, Puerto Rico, but also with cases that are not that easy, like uh, the Dominican Republic or Cuba. Uh, so if you could say something about method, like oh. you know if I were to study these cases, I would think about these things or I would analyze these issues, mm -hmm. and maybe if you could say something about intuitively what you think about substance, right? So the conclusion of this would be, from what I've seen in Puerto Rico, I could say this or that, you know, just both form and substance, I would say, in a way. I guess the approaches that I settled on had a lot to do with the questions I was asking. And the question started with that whole sense of unease about why isn't it working? Not that I had a, a, a conclusion about why it wasn't working, but I just couldn't make sense of this is what it's supposed to do, but why isn't it happening? And um, one thing I did, I guess, was not to restrict sources to just strictly form a legal sources. And I, 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 I cast a pretty wide net and I said, okay, I'm gonna look at wherever constitutional discourse is discussed. What, is, what are the understandings and what are they using the rules for? What are they using the strategies for? And who's really benefiting? So I guess that kind of trying to connect interests to, to the strategy and to whatever crystallizes at the end. Because, um, I guess that was one way I tried to do that. Um, and I was also, I guess, very alert to the differences in understanding from the source jurisdiction to the receiving jurisdictions. And the anecdote I like telling about that was actually started here when I was in LLM. Professor Chase was asking us in an intro to American law course, what's the rationale for the US Senate? And I, and I initially thought of the rationale that we have for the Philippines, which was that our Senate is nationally elected, so it gives a national perspective, and our House is municipal in perspective, so it's that balance between local and national. And then he talks about the Connecticut Compromise, and I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and then, <laughs> then, so I guess that whole, um, you have to, for me, I would try to always be sensitive to those, well, 
digressions on both sides because it's the same term, it's the same institution, sometimes even the same language. Um, it, but I would be very attentive to usage, I guess. For, and as for the, I guess, what conclusion? I guess it depends on the question you're asking about the experience. So I, I don't know if that helps. Uh, uh, Jane, Jane Bester. A question prompted by uh, I, an admittedly cursory reading of Kim Shepley's paper, um, "The End of the End of History." Um, yeah. It's I'm wondering. It, it struck me that her concept of a democrator is <clears throat> predicated on the idea that these recent deviations from democratic constitutionalism are departures from recent, uh, recently established norms. And it seems to me that your, and she uses the Philippines, of course, as a case example. I think you've read, looked at the paper, right? Um, and it strikes me that your, your analysis uh, cuts a shaft mm -hmm. through her whole approach by suggesting that indeed what's going on in the Philippines today has, is part of a very important tradition the, of um, very serious issues that cannot be satisfactorily analyzed in the terms in which she poses the problem. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Well, just you know, from a cursory reading of the, the paper, I guess my, the approach I felt was a little flipped. It was looking at what was going on in individual countries in terms of concepts that already had predetermined content and f in a way f trying to shoehorn those experiences into those categories was the impression I got. But I guess w in calling um, the democrators departures from like established norms. I want, I, what I would say to that is that the norms are double-edged or maybe, mm -hmm. or the tradition mm -hmm. is double-edged, meaning it's about limits, but it's also about power. And I think what was being, what was engaged more in the Philippine setting was the power dimension, but it's not an aberration, it's part of it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's what I would say to that, that what norm are you talking about? Because I, I think, yeah, so I hope it addresses that. <laughs> so I may take the chair's prerogative to ask a question following on the last couple. So uh, I'm a little, I was a little cherry of asking a question because uh, as the so-called Henry Stimson professor, uh, <laughs> oh. um, of course uh, uh, in Leah's book he comes off relatively positively, at least compared to other imperial governors, uh, although he did not create the Davis Cup in tennis as his successor did. Uh, but so I'm interested in something of Professor Capazzolo probably as a real historian uh, uh, might branch up, but, but the way in which um, the so-called lessons of history are or are not absorbed and learned by others later who, who have power. You begin and end the book by talking uh, briefly about the American experience uh, in Iraq and suggesting uh, uh, an, an analogy of sorts, although you're careful. And I guess I want to um, go um, so a different focus than uh, Helena LBR's on uh, Puerto Rico or um, other U.S. colonies. Look a little further in terms of just the um, more loosely defined American imperial experience of more recent times, uh, Iraq uh, being the most notable, and the extent to which any of the painful lessons that you describe so thoughtfully, so thoroughly, um, have been absorbed. Uh, obviously, people didn't have the benefit of your book, and they're not people in policy positions not are not by and large scholars. But to the extent the sort of lessons of the Philippine experience are communicated back in a broader um, sense, um, the degree to which they have informed, or are we simply in slightly different form repeating again and again and again the same. Um, 
uh, uh, mistakes or failing to see the tensions more adequately, but as you suggest, the, the, the conflicting tensions that course throughout the history between the way we conceive of ourselves as a liberal republic and then what we actually do. I mean, for, not to turn on, but for example, uh, if you took, if one took somewhat seriously the Bush administration's explanations for um, not only the intervention in Iraq, but subsequent efforts to write a constitution, and some members of the faculty involved in that, um, um, it wasn't simply imperialism for the sake of imperialism. There was supposedly a higher a mission justifying that, even as uh, more material concerns like uh, geopolitical considerations, oil, et cetera, were in the background. So just to what degree, if at all, do you see the lessons of, that you captured so well, uh, understood, expressed? I have to say that I guess I've grown a lot more skeptical about the, that kind of a project. Because I often wonder, like, could w if the Philippines had been left alone and not um, mm -hmm. maybe have been educated in this um, tradition. I mean, there is evidence that they were looking at other places, the uh, Filipino leaders were. And I kind of wonder, would they have done worse, better? I'm not convinced it mm -hmm. would have been terrible. So I guess my, but, but of course, that there's so many other issues at play, but at least from this part, from the constitutional experience, I'm, I'm kind of more inclined to let people figure their own <laughs> way out. I, I don't know if that's, a, if that's feasible politically, but there's, I, I just feel like there were so many, um, you could, sorry, so when you said in the Philippines, you, they did set up this system and they were, they were trying, the Americans were trying to make sure to balance the representation with control but no matter what structure I think is in, in place, people will always find a way to mm -hmm. maneuver around it anyway. So, um, and I guess the, the, there'd be more accountability if the players themselves were to um, undertake the whole effort, the effort, but I'm not sure if that's, uh, again, yeah. If I were to, yeah, if it were, if, if that's even possible, could, yeah. Because it's so it's so it's so much a part of the whole program for international law. So thank you. Uh, opportunity for other questions, comments, observations. Would either of our commentators like to have a further word, closing word, before we turn back to Leah one last time? Um, well, I guess, yeah, what, um, this is a, it's, it's not a critical question, but a curiosity question of, of where, where you would take this project next. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what remain, you know, what, what questions remain to be answered in, in either in Philippine legal history or in history of law and empire? Um, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. What's funny is that, um, I'm pretty open right now about um, the, the new project, like the next project. I don't, um, but I am increasingly drawn to one part of the, the, the book that I didn't get into, which you pointed out, which is the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very curious about church-state relations um, in the Philippines. So that might be, so I didn't touch on that at all, and um, in, uh, if only because to find out how that played out, I, and how, of course, how that impacted today's um, relationship between um, the church and the state in the Philippines, I kind of want to find that out. Um, but I, I'm also curious about um, going in deeper detail, uh, studying the, the in, I guess, more of an intellectual history, mm -hmm. ordering Philippine legal thought, I guess, is the other thing I'm very curious about. But yeah, so. Thank you, and Jerry? I guess the, the question I would ask is, uh, do you see the story you tell uh, as a very specific decolonization story or as a common decolonization story? 
One of the things um, that comes across very strongly in the book is the idea of the, the independence party uh, which views itself as identified with the interests of the people because it is struggling against the colonial master uh, and then doesn't draw very carefully a distinction uh, between its own interests and interests of other people who are also part of the colonized people. And then once independence comes, uh, the, the dominant group within the colony that has achieved independence uh, becomes a dominating elite uh, that is not attended to the interests of the colonized people. Uh, is that a more generalizable story? Uh, is, that, is that something that uh, one might be interested in pursuing further? Uh, or is that so dependent on a variety of different uh, circumstances that, it, that you'd rather not say anything even slightly general about it? Because you're such a good historian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually read a lot of the post-colonial literature that does um, that studies that development that move where the I guess the colonial elites would later take over the the independent state and would stay in power. And so I think it, it might look a little bit different, the permutations might be different, but I think it's happened, and from at least from what I've seen, it's probably um, not uncommon to, for, for that dynamic to have taken place. And for the, it's interesting that you brought up the dominating elite, because I think that this whole, um, so we have this new president, right? <laughs> and, um, and while it looks really horrible, what he's doing, I can't help but think that it's a backlash. Um, because of uh, this same group of people who have been in power, have been there since the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And I guess people just want to try something new, and I, I get that. But um, so maybe that will be like the next story to that, to what is the popular response once the dominating elite has somehow exhausted its <laughs> chances? I don't know. But um, yeah, so. And Chris has another question. So I, I'd realized there was one question that I, that I did want to ask, uh, another one. So in 2000, back, all the way back in 2002, um, Sanford Levinson made a, a very clear call to uh, instill the insular cases into the canon of constitutional law. Right? Uh, so, and I think that that project is still unfinished. But if you were going to do it, right, um, you know, what would you, what, you know, are there one or two cases from the Philippine Supreme Court's history that you think should or could really fruitfully be taught in Con Law One to really sort of, you know, sort of remind um, American lawyers in training that the U.S. is an empire, established imperial orders, and maintained them for a century or more. I don't think it's going to be that direct, but I, if I were to use some cases from the Philippines, I would use the ones uh, um, discussing the power of the governor general, because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of this moves about inherent sovereign um, sovereign authority is invoked. And I, I guess I would connect that as a consequence of Congress having sovereignty over the islands that was unrestricted by the Constitution. But you have to kind of connect the dots more. But that would be, a, I think, a powerful example of what that power looked like. What did you enable? What did the cases enable um, in the Philippines? Another interesting thing for me would be police power doctrine, just because um, I, I think from what I read from the legal history on the US side, um, the prerogatives were broad because the assumption was local self-governance. But this tradition, this this power was invoked in the Philippines, but the, there was no local self-governance, so it was not checked in that sense. So it's this whole idea that um, you can't sever rules from the, the institutional context where they're, where they're supposed, that's supposed to um, control 
the reach of the power. So I guess, again, as a consequence of the Philippine status and location in the federal architecture outside of it, so that's what it's going to look like. So even, because what, what strikes me about um, the use of Philippine constitutional rules and, and decisions even in the Philippines is that when you read the case books from, from the colonial period, it's like, oh, we really did you a great favor because this is such of a protection. <laughs> um, and the Philippine law is just an eddy of American law. But, and because you have this, you have police power, you have the Bill of Rights, but then there's not, and it stops there. But what you need to look, what I think you needs to be looked at is how was it really implemented? And what were the, what were the situations in which it was invoked? And, um, and what were the consequences for the, for the future? Because I, I really think that the, like the playing field is really important. You can't sever a doctrine from a playing field that's more restrictive and then putting it in where there's not that many mm -hmm. hedges and expect it to function the same way. So I guess that would, and I think the insular cases were important in setting that playing field. So even if you have the doctrines going over there, I don't think they played out the same way. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Leah, um, for the fascinating talk. Um, uh, my question is a little bit off the topic of the book, but thank you. But it's kind of relevant uh, to the grant research question. You talk about the making of the modern state in the Philippines. Uh, and I think there is a very uh, important concept within it that's sovereignty. So you, you look at through constitutional law, and some people look at through international law. Right, Philippine, um, 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 the period you covered um, contains uh, Philippine under colonial rule and after it gets independence. And my question is, did you encounter a any material that um, Philippine legal or political elites, their vision on international order or international law has been influenced by the U.S. counterpart? Whether their with the Filipino vision of international order at 1930s, 1940s, or 1950s has been influenced by the U.S. vision of international order at that period. That is, um, um, uh, in, making, in making a modern state, Filipinos' uh, concept, the vision of sovereignty and the international order has been influenced by the U.S. or is influenced by the uh, anti-colonial movement more. I think there was a consciousness uh, from the framers um, when they were drafting the Philippine Constitution to look in step with international developments. And I guess there was a provision where they renounced war as a, an instrument of state policy. And that would be in line with the whole movement to um, control the use of force, to regulate the use of force. I would say, I, th I, I do think that our vision of, um, at least at that point, would have been heavily influenced by U.S. practice more than others. But um, and the, the Philippines was very active in, in the United Nations in its early days. So one of the our foreign minister would be I'm not sure what secretary general of the, the one of the earliest secretary generals of the assembly. So they were very much in with the order that was being created after World War II. The Philippines was a, a very active participant in that world. So um, and the the origins of that order would have been American. So but I haven't really looked specifically at that question, like what the where the content of the the ideas would came from at that point for yeah. Thank you very much. I think we'll conclude our session. But again, we want to congratulate you. Leah on this amazing book. Thank you. And thank our commentators. And thank the Harvard Law School Library for making this possible. Thank you, everybody.